for our inaugural noontime program for our 2015 series. Um, we do these every month on a third Wednesday, every month except December. We let everybody take a break during the holiday season. So our February program, that'll be February 18th at noon, will be yours truly be talking about uh, a community out in Washington County near Elkins, it's near the Washington Madison County line, an old community known as Chicken Bristle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who's heard of it? Anybody? <laughs> Chicken Bristle. And uh, the effects of the Civil War on the folks that lived out around this Chicken Bristle community. So that'll be our next sandwich then, February 18th at noon. We have a new exhibit that's opening next week, January 26th, called Out of the Dark Room. It's a photo exhibit curated by well-known photographer Don House. Don used to be our darkroom technician here for several years, and he's gone back to his own darkroom work now. But he, before he left, picked some of his favorite images of the ones that he had seen in his work here in the darkroom. Picked some that spoke to him and has written little essays about each one. So that exhibit opens January 26th. The reception for him is Thursday, January 29th. Thursday, January 29th from 5.30 to 7. So Don will be here. You want to come back and he'll offer a few comments. He's not going to, he's a shy fellow. He doesn't want to stand up and make a speech, but he will offer some comments on the photos he selected. So come back for that. You can meet him yourself. The reason we have Dennis here today is because of another exhibit, a photo exhibit in our hallway about lime quarries. Not lime the fruit, but lime the <laughs> mineral that's found here in the Arkansas Ozarks. So um, be sure and see that photo exhibit out in our hallway before you leave. Okay, everybody comfortable? Anybody have anything you want to say before I introduce the speaker? Let Aaron get some more chairs out before, before we get started. That's a pretty good sign when we have to roll out more chairs. <laughs> I'll say this about Dennis. If you ever have a chance, you know, Hobbs State Park offers eagle cruises and also springtime cruises on a nice brand new pontoon boat with a, a volunteer interpreter. And you go out during eagle season, you go out and look for eagles. And during the early spring, you can see the lake from uh, through the eyes of looking at it from a natural point of view. What is springtime on Beaver Lake like? So if you ever get a chance to do that at Hobbs State Park, be sure to go when Dennis Bean is the volunteer interpreter. You won't be sorry. <laughs> you won't be sorry. You got done. <laughs> <laughs> orders. He asked me ten minutes ago, Aaron, Aaron, it's very good to, to watch out for our, the comfort of our guests. He's our collections and education assistant. He came up to me about ten minutes ago and said, do I need to flat more chairs? <laughs> so, thank you, Aaron, for not listening to me. <laughs> All right, Dennis Dean, this fellow here, is an Arkansas and Florida master naturalist. We have some other master naturalists here. And anybody else who's master naturalist? I knew the man and Cody are master naturalist. He has over 14 years experience teaching a variety of nature subjects to people of all ages, which is a real gift. You can talk to kids, that's a gift. If you can talk to us big kids, that's a gift. But when you can talk to both, that's something. Dennis currently lectures. He's a very popular lecturer. He is uh, one of the routine presenters at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Arkansas. He talks at various Arkansas state parks. Uh, Hobbs State Park is maybe your, you consider that your home base, yeah. Hobbs State Park. <laughs> yeah. The Janet Huckabee Nature Center in Fort Smith, and he also ventures into public schools in the region to, to present these nature programs. And recently, just last November, <laughs> he was named Volunteer of the Year by the Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality. So yeah. congratulations mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Now, in his former life, what do you think he did for a living? Now, if you know, don't tell. <laughs> in his former 
her life. What do you think Dennis did for a living? He was a trial attorney in Florida for over 45 years. <laughs> but now he is following his bliss of nature study and sharing nature with the rest of us. He's here with us today to discuss disappearing ground, karst, sinkholes, caves, and more. Please join me in welcoming Arkansas Master Naturalist, Dennis Dean. I love to hear her talk. Uh, it's so nice to be here today. Um, I am going to try and get this done within an hour because I know that's the time schedule. Some of you have other things to do. If I tend to go over and you need to leave, feel free to get up and, and you know leave because uh, I certainly uh, understand. We're going to be talking about one subject today, but there are many parts to that subject. So um, just one thing before I get started, as Susan said, I'm an Arkansas Master, Master Naturalist, there's several here. Uh, we're starting a new class, February 21st, uh, and it will end May 16th. So it goes from February 21st to May 16th. Um, I have some uh, cards up here so you can access online and find out more about it. Uh, all the classes are on Saturdays. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, course. Like uh, Susan said, uh, the first one I took actually was 15 years ago in Florida through the auspices of the uh, University of Florida. And then uh, when I moved up here, I wanted to find a master naturalist. I found one out at Hobbs in 2009 and took that course. Wonderful course if you're interested in learning about all aspects of, of nature. All right. Oh, and also I want to mention to you, I brought, some of you have already taken advantage of it, but I have a lot of handouts. I'm big on handouts, as some of you may know, uh, but uh, they are appropriate to what I'm speaking about and will supplement, and a lot of things I'm saying are in those handouts, so feel free to, to help yourself to the handouts on that, on that back table. All right, uh, this is going to start out kind of like a uh, IMAX movie, you know, with the big sound and everything. You know, 300 million years ago, Arkansas was covered by an ocean. That's how we'll start out, uh, as were many other uh, states in what we now know as, as North America. But in that ocean, of course, there were living things. There were plants, uh, there were animals, there were small sea creatures. Um, and when they died, which they did, um, the uh, body itself kind of deteriorated, but many of the sea creatures that were uh, in, the, in the ocean fell to the bottom of the ocean. They had hard shells on them. Uh, very similar to the shells that you see on the beach today. Um, and some of their skeletons uh, were preserved. Some of the plants, likewise, were preserved. And these accumulated on the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, ocean. Uh, and that's where we get our fossils today, okay? And they would accumulate. They eventually were compressed. They were uh, kept uh, and encompassed forever within the, uh, in the rock that was developing around them. Uh, and uh, it would develop in layers, you know, and these layers kept developing uh, over a, a period of, of time. And this is what we see in the fossils, of course, that we have, and, and there's better specimens, probably you have some specimens of rock that have fantastic <laughs> fossils. I'm always looking for fossils, and I think it's great when you think they're millions of years old, you know, and they're preserved uh, in, the, in the rock. Well, what happened? Well, eventually that uh, rock uh, that had accumulated uplifted, and that's what formed the um, Ozarks, all right? That's what formed the Ozarks. Here's a good example um, of what happened. This is on the on-ramp at West Fork on I-49, if you're wondering, if you have to fly by, look over on the on the on-ramp, but here's a good example. You can see how this is pushing up. Uh, this is limestone, of course, and generally limestone is horizontal. It forms in a horizontal plane because I said you have these layers. Uh, that developed over millions of years in the water, and then it just uplifted. It was a plateau. You hear the term Ozark Plateau. Uh, that's what the Ozarks are uh, as they go north into, uh, into, into Missouri. But like I said, this is kind of a good, good example you can see of the rock pushing, pushing up. Now, not so with the Wachitas. You would think they're so close they were formed the same way. Not at all alike. There's the Wachitas. All right? I mean, you can see the difference. The Ozarks are horizontal, the Wachita's are slanted. And they were formed by, and this is in uh, downtown Hot Springs, in case you're wondering, some of you may have seen this. Mm -hmm. It's actually a parking lot. At one time, for some reason, they decided to uh, cover it over, I guess, with concrete, 
and then they opened it up, but you get a real good view of what the uh, Wachita's look like. And they're what they call folded. They, you know, they were formed by two land masses colliding into each other, and they have these tectonic plates, which you may have heard of, uh, and that's how the Ozarks were, were formed. So completely, completely different in their, in their formation. We're going to talk about primarily the Ozarks uh, today, because that's what we're talking about when we talk about cars. How many of you have heard that term cars? I imagine a lot of you have. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what we live on here. All right. Uh, when I was in Florida, the whole state of Florida is on a big slab of, of cars. And, uh, you know, what is cars? Well, uh, it's kind of interesting. Basically, it is uh, limestone. And karst is full of holes and cracks and crevices. Uh, it's like Swiss cheese. It soaks up like a sponge. The rock is always dissolving. And uh, it, it's the only place where true sinkholes are, are formed. Uh, where did karst come from? Well, this is where it came from, right here. Now, when I was growing up, and maybe a lot of you uh, were growing up, we didn't have all these countries changing their names every you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Anybody know what Slovenia used to be? As we were growing up, all of you know, Yugoslavia, yeah, yeah, it's Yugoslavia. Uh, now it's called Slovenia, but that's where Karst was uh, first named. Uh, Kar in Slovenian supposedly means cave, and Arst uh, means oak tree. Now I wonder what is cave, I can understand, oak tree, what do they have together? Well, you have to figure out and understand how Remember I said, limestone is always being dissolved. Well, what is that process? It's kind of an interesting process. You have rain coming down, all right? And rain picks up carbon dioxide, which is acidic. The rain hits the ground. You have leaf litter on the ground, more acid, more acidic. It leaches down into the limestone. What is limestone made of? Calcium carbonate, all right? When you mix calcium carbonate and carbon dioxide, you get, anybody know? You get an acid, carbonic acid. That's what forms, just like what's in your soda drinks. Okay, that's what forms, and that acid is what eats through the the limestone. You know, I I brought a piece. There's a piece of karst right there. <laughs> You've all seen. Uh, it is always deteriorating, uh, and uh, that is the process by which we have the caves, the underground streams, all the things we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, today. Now, as I said. Limestone, the karst topography began in Slovenia, Yugoslavia. That's what it looks like from the air. You know, just uh, you can see a lot of the, the uh, rocks that is rough, uh, has holes in it, um, somewhat similar to, you know, what we have around here. And it's found all over the world. Limestone is found and karst topographies are found all over the world. In China, they have some fantastic things here that are covered with um, uh, trees and foliage, but underneath that is limestone. These are, are limestone hills that they have in China. The Lunaya State For Stone Forest, also in China, is uh, all limestone. Lebanon has a lot of limestone. Spain <laughs> has limestone. Same thing we have, mm -hmm. same thing we have here. You can see the, you know, the horizontal, horizontal rocks, no different. Jerusalem, Israel. Uh, my wife and I had a chance to be over there last year, and it's fascinating because uh, several years ago in Jerusalem, they passed a law that all new buildings built in the city of Jerusalem had to have limestone as their outer... And you might say, well, wait a minute, you said it's always disintegrating. <laughs> well, they don't get a whole lot of rain over there, and that's kind of a desert you know, type of atmosphere, and they have a lot of limestone rock. Um, as you can as you can see, um, you know, this is the old wall around the city built out of limestone many, many thousands of years ago. So uh, used as a, as a building material. The Sphinx, a lot of you are familiar with the Sphinx. If you look online, at least I did this about three months ago, and I don't know if it's still true, but they had a lot of scaffolding on a picture of the Sphinx because it's deteriorating. Again, made out of limestone, constructed of limestone many thousands of, of years ago. Here's a map of the United States that shows the primary uh, limestone areas that we have. Uh, of course, here's where we are here. Here's where the Ozarks are, one of the larger 
areas, probably second only to, to Florida, which I said is a big slab, but you can see there's limestone scattered all over the, uh, the United States. Several U.S. cities are built on top of, uh, of cars. St. Louis, as you might imagine, <coughs> Nashville, Tennessee, Birmingham, Alabama, Austin, Texas, you can see why. Uh, and of course, in our area, Bella Vista, uh, and the whole northwest section of, of Arkansas. Actually, in Arkansas, we have 19 counties uh, that are considered in the karst area, and they all, as you might expect, are up in this area, uh, which connects with the Ozarks that go into in the Missouri. Bryce Canyon, you know, again, visit some other places. Some of you may have been and uh, are familiar with different types of, uh, of limestone. Montezuma Castle is real interesting. It's outside of um, Phoenix, Arizona, um, and a big slab of limestone, as you can see, but there's an uh, Indian tribe that constructed their home out of that, in that limestone uh, hill. And you wonder, well, how, you know, how did they get up and how did they get down? Well, it's simple. Here's a recreation of what it looked like. And as you can see, simple. Look, they had ladders <laughs> for the different floors in their, you know, in their home. Ladders, I guess, from the top, ladders from the bottom. That's how they existed. But that was carved out of, out of limestone. Fascinating piece of, of engineering. This is kind of interesting. I'm going to go through this real quick. This is in Kansas. And you might say, what the heck is that? Well, this served as a U.S. Army a storage facility uh, for a number of years in eastern Kansas. This is what it looked like inside. And as you can see, that's limestone. You know, it's a gigantic limestone cave. A few years ago, uh, about three or four years ago, a guy bought it from the government for $510,000, and he came up with this idea of using it as a storage facility for Armageddon. And he was trying to sell pieces, uh, you know, you could buy a piece of this property for Armageddon if you wanted to. It hadn't been real successful, but uh, it's got two million square feet of space available, again, in this cave. In, uh, in Kansas, uh, limestone cave, kind of, kind of interesting. Have you ever been to New Hampshire, New Grandfather Mountain, right? New Grandfather Mountain? Well, unfortunately, several years ago, Grandfather Mountain collapsed and <laughs> it fell to the ground. And that often happens when you're dealing with, uh, with that karst topography, with, the, uh, with the, the limestone. The water just eats through that. And we'll, uh, we'll see some more pictures of that. This is Beaver Lake. All right, this is what we call actually Red Rock Bluff. It's directly across uh, from Rocky Branch uh, Marina. But it's a good example of what we have not only on Beaver Lake, but in this area. Uh, i point out several features of it. Uh, this is all, of course, limestone, but this is a different type of limestone. Whenever you see the dark color in limestone, in the lighter limestone, if it's over 50% magnesium, and that's what causes that dark color. It's a mineral. Over 50% magnesium, do you know what the rock is then called? Got an idea? You've heard of it. Dolomite. That's what dolomite is. Dolomite is nothing more than limestone with over 50% of magnesium contained in it. And you see that all over this area, northwest Arkansas, anywhere there is a lot of, uh, a lot of limestone. You also will see some red color. And that's another mineral, most of you know. That's iron that, again, has leached through, <coughs> like, remember, limestone is very soluble, <laughs> and everything leaches through it, and the, li the uh, <coughs> iron will leave a stain, the magnesium shows up, which is a mineral. At the bottom of a rock formation, you see a lot of this, and you see this wherever you have a lot of rock, not only here, if you go out west, anywhere where they have rock that is subject to uh, falling and crumbling, it, you know, accumulates at the bottom, but it actually has a name. And just to share that with you, anybody, it's got two names, really. Anybody know what the name of a fallen rock that accumulates is? Talus. You've probably heard of it. Talus. Somebody said talus. That's one of the names. Anybody know the other name? Scree. S-C-R-E-E. -E. You may have heard that. They use both names. I don't know why, but you hear both names interchangeable. But either talus or scree. So whenever you see rock like that uh, that's fallen, that's the, that's the name of it. Uh, Goat Bluff. Anybody ever been on Goat Bluff? I know we got some people from the uh, Hill and Dale Hiking Club here, uh, out by the Buffalo River. Uh, fantastic place, about 350 feet above the um, uh, Buffalo River. 
uh, which you see below, and uh, no railings. <laughs> it's a little scary getting there. You have to crawl through a hole actually to get to this point. This is my son, and I went out there uh, on a uh, on a hike. But a fascinating place again, showing the uh, the limestone that we have in this area. Uh, anybody know where that is? When I went out there, you couldn't. It, let's say it was, there was no trespassing, but where I went in, it didn't say no trespassing. Okay. You know, so I figured, why not? Now it's been open to people and it's been sold. Mm -hmm. Anybody know? Dog, dog patch. patch. Yeah, dog patch. Uh, this is dog patch. Uh, I don't know why they built, uh, constructed this. I don't know why, but it's a neat, you know, uh, sculpture that somebody made out there at, at Dog Patch again out of out of limestone, showing what can be can be done. Okay, I mentioned about the water process of, of eating away limestone. I'll show you a couple of pictures that show that. You've all seen it when you're out hiking. But you can see that water is, is eating through this limestone very slowly. Here you see a water bottle I had. So it's <laughs> eating through that limestone and coming out there at the bottom. It'll take you know many years to completely separate that, but it will happen because there's what happened. And you can see at one time this was you know one piece of, of limestone and over you know all of the water leaching through it and the acid developing. It, that's how it. Uh, cuts apart the, uh, the limestone. Sometimes limestone falls like dominoes. I took this out at Roaring River State Park. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. Fascinating place to see a lot of limestone. But this is a gigantic piece of rock to give you an idea of the size of it. Again, there's my son standing on it. That had just separated from over in this, this area. You know, again as a result of water. Um, and to give you an idea, I, I tried to figure out, you know, how much that that weighs. Any of you have been out on Tanyard Creek before it was destroyed by the water uh, a while back? You know, knows there's a bridge out there, uh, and right by that bridge is a big piece of limestone. And they estimated that that piece of limestone out there at Tanyard Creek in Bella Vista weighed 62 tons. Uh, that piece of rock was probably one fifth the size of, of this. You know, so to get an idea of the amount of weight that is being eroded or weathered by the, the water uh, processes. Um, and uh, just, it's, it's interesting to see, just like a domino, you know, it just falls, falls over. Uh, I, I talked about West Fork earlier. This is on the off ramp going north uh, on West Fork. This was sometime last year. I have to notice that a big piece of limestone has just, you know, fallen. It was up here. And uh, I was lucky enough to be out there just a couple of days afterward. That is newly fallen. And, they eventually uh, removed it. You go out there now, you can't even tell. But that, you know, that of course is what what happens. So you need to be careful walking around limestone, especially like Whitaker Point <laughs> after a rainstorm. Not a good place to be, I've been told. Uh, anybody have an idea where this is? That's a hole. It's hard to see. That's a hole eaten completely through that rock by water. That's out at Lost Valley. Okay, down by the the waterfall at, at the end there depending on the time of year you go, but again, you can see the power of, of water that will heat right through that uh, that limestone and a big enough <coughs> opening now for somebody to walk right through. You see a lot of this on our limestone rocks. You see trees that look like they're growing out of rocks, right? Uh, anybody knows what kind of trees those are? They're generally the juniper family. They do not need very much water. And that is generally part of a glade area. We'll talk about a glade a little bit, a little bit later. But you see these trees all the time. Their roots are in the rocks, just getting enough water to survive. They look real straggly, but you often see that in a limestone or karst type of environment. Um, only this is not in Arkansas. It's a Grand Canyon. Okay. Grand Canyon, as you know, has lots of lots of limestone in addition to other. Uh, rock formations in its area, but uh, you can see tremendous uh, uh, examples of, of uh, limestone out in the Grand Canyon. Now, a glade area, what is a glade area? Uh, if you remember that picture that I showed you earlier out on Beaver Lake of the limestone, a glade area is generally at the top of a limestone rock formation. Uh, can be at the at the bottom. Uh, there's a when we take our eagle cores out on Beaver Lake. There's an area there right by marker six. If any of you are familiar with that, they put those markers out for boaters. Uh, but there's a glade right there that is probably 10 feet above the water, which is kind of unusual. 
to have it that low. But the, what uh, Bladen is a very environmentally sensitive area. There's only certain types of animals and plants and creatures that, that hang out uh, because it doesn't get any water. You see a totally different uh, type of, of trees and plant growing in a glade area. Um, you generally see the, uh, the junipers um, and the cedars, those type of trees. You'll see roadrunners out there. Deer like to feed uh, in a glade area. There's certain types of caterpillars that you'll only find in a, in a glade area. But a glade is just an area on top of, of rocks, uh, kind of like uh, you see here. Uh, here's another glade area that's out at uh, Leatherwood Park. Some of you may be familiar with by Bella, by Bella Vista. I'm not Bella Vista, by Eureka Springs. And this is after a rain. Uh, this is right uh, next to the dam, if you know where the dam is at Leatherwood Park. And this is all a glade area. That's what you see. You see these kind of trees. Uh, you don't see too much of anything else uh, growing because there's so much rock. Uh, but it is a, uh, a unique area in, uh, in the cartography. <laughs> All right, let's move on to sinkhole. All right, and what is a sinkhole? Well, you can see right here, uh, and most of you know it's a hole in the Earth's surface. Uh, it is a natural drain into the water table, uh, often a source of fresh water, definitely a home for marine life, um, very often a cavern entrance, um, a cool microclimate, and a sudden collapse uh, can swallow a highway or a building and create something, something else. So how is the sinkhole made? Well, there's various ways that sinkholes are created, and here you see some of the uh, some of the ways. Let me start at the bottom. What you have generally underground is you'll have water uh, that will be uh, created uh, underground in a karst environment. A lot of it will be held in place. Some of it will be flowing. Uh, you might have a pool. And what does a pool do? It puts pressure on the uh, ground underneath that. Uh, that pool. Um, you have people that often will pump water out from the aquifer down here to use, uh, you know, to use for their house and, and for other reasons, maybe farming, maybe irrigation. So that's removing water that is acting as a source that's holding up the ground. Well, if enough water is pumped out, or too much water is pumped out, or there's too much pressure on the underground, uh, underlying uh, soil. Uh, it's going to collapse, and that's what <coughs> makes the sinkhole. Um, here's the sinkhole prone states. I would probably include, you know, Arkansas, because we have a lot of sinkholes in Arkansas, but these, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, are the main states that are, are prone to, uh, to sinkholes. And this is what can happen by uh, pumping too much groundwater. I think this was in North Carolina, if I remember. But it's just, you know, you pump out that groundwater that's holding up what's above it, and there isn't anything there, and eventually it will just collapse. Now I'm going to go through a lot of pictures that some of you are familiar with. There's two types of sinkholes, actually. There's what they call subsistence sinkholes, and those are generally created by human activity, like pumping out too much water, uh, maybe putting in a, a pool or something that puts a lot of pressure on the uh, underground uh, uh, soil. Those are subsistence sinkholes. The ones that uh, are more dramatic are what they call collapse uh, sinkholes. And we'll see both, both kinds of, of those. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. You may have seen this in the paper. This was in Springtown, uh, where a sinkhole had uh, opened up on this uh, gentleman's uh, property. And you can see it, the water not just stopped here. It went down you know, quite a ways into the uh, ground. Uh, filled a large uh, pool underneath, and that sometimes is how our caves and, and caverns and underground springs uh, develop. This is out at Hop State Park along the Pigeon Roost uh, Trail, uh, an offshoot of it. There are several sinkholes out there. Uh, this one is probably about 25.